Yes, maybe. Listen. The same blood flows in both our veins, doesn't it, my sister? The blood of Oedipus. And suffering, which was his destiny, is our punishment too. The sentence passed on all his children. Physical pain, contempt, insults, every kind of dishonor. We've seen them all and endured them all, the two of us. But there's more to come. Now, today, This new proclamation which the king has made to the whole city. Have you heard how those nearest to us are to be treated? With a contempt that we reserve for traitors, people we love. Nobody has told me anything, Antigone. I've heard nothing, neither good nor bad, about anyone we love. Not since the battle, I mean. The terrible news that both our brothers were dead. One day, one battle and fratricide twice over. Each brother cutting down his own flesh. But the army from Argos retreated last night. I have heard that. Nothing else to cheer me up or depress me further. I thought you hadn't. That's why I asked you to meet me here, where I can tell you everything without any risk of being overheard. What is it, then? More terrible news. Something black and frightening, I can see that. Well, what do you think is meaning? Perhaps you can guess. We have two brothers, both of them dead. And Crayon has decreed that a decent burial shall be given to one, but not to the other. Ediacles apparently has already been buried with full military honors, not far short of a state funeral, with all the formalities due to the dead meticulously observed, so that his rest in the underworld amongst the heroes is assured. But Polynices, who died in agony just as certainly as his brother did, is not to be buried at all. The decree makes that quite plain. He is to be left, lying where he fell, with no tears or ceremonies of mourning, to stink in the open, till the kites and vultures catch the scent and tear him to pieces and pick him to the bone. Left unburied, there is no rest for him in the underworld, no more than here. What a great king our crayon is, eh, sister? It's against us, you realize, and against me in particular, that he has published this decree. And he'll soon be here himself to make it public to the senators and anyone who may not have heard it. He isn't bluffing. He means to act to make it stick. The punishment for anyone who disobeys the order is public stoning to death. So that's the news. And you know it now. The time has come for you too to stand up and be counted with me, to show whether you are worthy of the honor of being Oedipus' daughter. Wait a minute, Antigone. Don't be so headstrong. If all this is as you say it is, what can I do, one way or the other? Just say you will help me. Commit yourself. To do what? Something dangerous? Just to give me a hand to lift the body. It's too heavy for me to move on my own. To bury him, you mean, in spite of the decree? He's my brother. And whatever you say, he's yours, too. I won't betray him now that he's dead. No one will ever throw that in my face. You can't do it. Crayon has publicly forbidden it. He cannot forbid me to love my brother. He has neither the right nor the power to do that. Have you forgotten what happened to our father? Contempt and loathing from everyone, even from himself, that was his reward. And blinded, too, by his own hand. And his mother-wife, as ill-matched with him as those two words are with each other, she knotted a rope and hanged herself. And now our two brothers, both in one day, caught in the same trap, claiming blood for blood and death for death, each one at the expense of the other. We are the last ones left, sister. And what a death is promised for us, more terrible than any if we break the law by defying the king and the power of the state. Think for a moment, Antigone, please. We're women, that's all. Physically weaker and barred from any political influence. How can we fight against the institutionalized strength of the male sex? They are in power and we have to obey them, or worse tyrannies than these may be inflicted upon us. May God forgive me and the spirits of the dead. We have no choice. State power commands and we must do as we are told. When you are powerless, wild gestures and heroic refusals are reserved for madmen. Don't say any more. I won't ask again. In fact, if you were to offer help now, I would refuse it. Do as you please. I intend to bury my brother 
And if I die in the attempt, I shall die in the knowledge that I have acted justly, and that will be a kind of happiness. I shall lie peacefully beside my brother, whom I loved in my actions as well as in words. Our lives are short. We have too little time to waste it on men and the laws they make. The approval of the dead is everlasting. And I shall bask in it as I lie among them. Do as you please. Live by all means. The laws you will break are not of man's making. I reverence them. But how can I defy the unlimited power of the state? What weapons of mine are strong enough for that? Fine. That's a good excuse. I'll go and shovel the earth on my brother's body. I'm frightened, Antigone. I'm frightened for you. Don't be frightened for me. Fear for yourself. For God's sake, keep it quiet. Don't tell anyone. I'll keep our meeting secret. Don't you dare. You must tell everyone. Shout it in the streets. If you keep it quiet, I shall begin to hate you. There's a fire burning in you, Antigone, but it makes me go cold just to hear you. Well, I'm not doing it to please you. You won't do it at all. You're bound to fail. I shall fail when I have failed and not before. But you know it's hopeless. Why begin when you know there's no way you can succeed? Be quiet! Before I begin to despise you for talking so feebly. He will despise you too. Unjustly. You can go now. Go! If I'm mad, you can leave me here with my madness, which will doubtless destroy me soon enough. Death is the worst thing that can happen. And some deaths are more honorable than others. If you've made your mind up, Antigone, it's madness. Remember, I love you. Whatever happens. <laughs> snowy eagle from the mountain crest it came, shrieking down on our city. The army of Argos with a spurious treaty to enforce Polynices' claim. All its horsehair plumes nodding together, and the grinding of brass, and the creaking of leather. By our seven shuttered gates it waited. Eyes glittering in dark helmets. Swords drawn, spears couching. But before the killing and burning. The metallic taste of blood. And crashing stonework and blazing wood. They turned and fled. The music of death in their ears. At their backs, the dragon's breath. Zeus has seen them. He who hates his native pride and the empty boast of the windbag. He heard their singing as if the victory were theirs for the taking. And he brought down his thunder on their glittering host. Struck them with lightning and sent them flying. Swore them and burned them and left them dying. Down like a rock from the mountain crest he came, thundering to earth. The flame dashed from his hand. The son of Thebes, whose best hope of fame was to conquer his native land and who failed in his quest. For the war god gave us his word of command. Like a battle chariot, his terrible name ran them down where they stood, and they died in the dust. Now at each of our seven gates, a Theban defender waits, as seven champions bring their fame and armor to the fight. And before the coming of night, Six have put their fame to the test. Six have laid both fame and armor to rest as a tribute at great Zeus' feet. At the seventh gate, two brothers meet, sharing their blood in death as in birth. Each striking together, 
each laying the other dead on the earth. Why has he called us here to debate an emergency session? His new proclamation, so vital to the state. Senators, our country, like a ship at sea, has survived the hurricane. The gods who sent it have navigated us into calmer waters now. I have chosen to summon this assembly because I know I can trust you. Your predecessors were loyal and reliable in King Laius' time, and when King Oedipus, in his exceptional wisdom, restored the fortunes of this city. When tragedy struck him and his rule was ended, your loyalty to the blood royal was never questioned, and you supported his sons till they too were brought down on a single day, incestuously murdered, each brother shedding a brother's blood. By that same blood right, as next of kin, I claim the throne as my inheritance, both the city and the kingdom. I claim it, and I hold it from today as mine by right. There is no certain measure of a man's quality, the depth of his intellect, or the maturity of his judgment, until he is put to the supreme test by the exercise of absolute power in the state. My own opinion is well known. The ruler who fears the consequences of his actions or who is afraid to act openly or take the good advice of his senators is beneath contempt. Equally contemptible is the man who puts the interests of his friends or his relations before his country. There is nothing good can be said of him. Let me make it plain before the gods whose eyes are in every council chamber. When I see any threat to this nation from whatever direction, I shall make it public. No one who is an enemy of the state shall ever be any friend of mine. The state, the fatherland, is everything to us. The ship we all sail in. If she sinks, we all drown, and friendship drowns with us. That's my policy. A policy of service to the Commonwealth. And in pursuance of that policy, I have issued an official state decree concerning the sons of Oedipus. Eteocles, who died fighting for his country and with exceptional bravery. We shall bury him with all the honors and funeral ceremonies customary for a man who died a hero. The other, the outcast, the exile, his brother Polynices, 
who returned here at the head of a foreign army to destroy his homeland, burn down this city and reduce the people to a condition of slavery or kill them in the streets. I have ordered that he is to have no grave at all. No one is to bury him or mourn for him. His body is to be left in the open, uncovered, a stinking feast for the scavengers, dogs and crows, a sight to inspire terror. I intend to make it quite plain that never under my administration will people who commit crimes against the state reap any benefits from their actions and at the expense of honest, decent citizens too. The people who serve the state, alive or dead, that makes no difference. I shall honor them and reward them too. Son of Monoikius, you are king now. You have delivered your verdict and sentence upon the man who defended the city and the man who attacked it unambiguously. Your least word has the force of law and it binds the dead as well as the living. We are all at your disposal. Make sure then that my orders are carried out. Younger men than us should implement your policies. <laughs> I don't mean that. Polynices' body is already under guard. What else must we do? What other responsibility do you lay upon us? Not to intrigue with dissidents or subversive elements. We are not mad, sir. We know the law and the penalty for breaking it. Which will be death. And be in no doubt I shall enforce it. Because there are always men who can be bought, who will risk anything, even death, if the bribe is large enough. <coughs> My Lord Crayon! Oh, oh, I can hardly speak for lack of breath. Not because I ran. I kept on stopping, as a matter of fact, half a dozen times. And I hung about as much as I dared. I haven't thought about anything so much for a long time. Listen, don't hurry, I said to myself. Chances are, Dimwit, you're hurrying to the firing squad. <laughs> But then I said to myself, you see, hang about, I said, or rather don't, because if Creon hears this from somebody else, you're really in trouble. So I hurried here as slow as I could, if you see what I mean. <laughs> it's funny how long a mile can take it when you're thinking what I was thinking. <laughs> However, duty called in the end, and I reckoned it would be safer to face it out. He may be unimportant, but I've come here, so now I'll tell you. <laughs> if I'm punished for it, the gods will be behind it, that's for sure. So I wouldn't have escaped it anyway. No sense, man. Why are you frightened? Well, first of all, sir, for myself, like, my own point of view, I've never done it, and I didn't see who else done it, neither, so I shouldn't be punished for it, should I? Is there any need for all this preamble? You take great care to dissociate yourself from what you say. It must be bad news. It, it is bad news, sir, I'm afraid. I don't know how to put it for the best. The plainest way, and then we can have done with you. Straight out with it, then. <laughs> The, the body's buried. Well, someone or other, a handful of dust, that's all, dry dust. But probably sprinkled, you know, religiously, and then gone, whoever it was. Do you know what you're saying? Who has dared to disobey my orders? No way of knowing, sir. We've no idea. There'd been no digging, no spade marks or nothing. The ground's rock hard. There were no wheel tracks either from a chariot or cart or anything. In fact, no clues of any kind at all. Nothing... Nothing to tell you who might have done it. Well, when the sentry taking the early turn discovered what had happened and reported back, we were all shattered and scared stiff. It was as though the body had disappeared. Well, not buried in a proper grave, I don't mean, but lightly covered with a layer of earth. Well, almost as though some passing stranger, with a religious turn of mind, knowing that being left unburied means everlasting anguish and wandering without rest, had scattered a few handfuls. There was no track of animals either. Not from dogs or anything who might have gnawed at it and covered it over with their hind legs like they do a bone. A real row started then, I can tell you. We all shouted at each other and it could have been a fight. There was no one there to stop us. Well, any one of us could have done it. We all suspected each other, but we all denied it. And there was no evidence to prove one man guilty rather than another. So then we all dared each other to swear to go through fire and water to old Red Ock pokers in our hands and call all the gods as witnesses that we hadn't done it and didn't know anyone who had or would even think of it, let alone do it. And none of any of it got us nowhere. But then one of the fellas had his say. <laughs> and he scared us all shitless, I can tell you. He said, and we knew he was dead, right? There was no way out of it. We had to do it and take our chances. This fella said, 
One of us lot must tell the king, because we can't just hide it, can we? That's what he said. And we knew he was right. So we decided we'd have to draw lots. <laughs> just my luck. I drew the short straw. So, here I am. And I don't like telling it, not one little bit more than you like hearing it. The bloke who brings bad news never gets a medal. My Lord Crown, this policy of yours has worried me from the start. My political instinct tells me this may be some sort of warning or sign, and perhaps from the gods. How dare you. Shut your mouths, both of you, before I lose my temper. And you, if you are a superannuated fool, at least don't talk like one. Is it likely remotely likely that the gods would think twice over that pile of stinking meat? By God, it's blasphemy! Even to suggest that they would care a damn whether he was buried or not, let alone grant him an honorable funeral as though he were one of their principal supporters, what? The man who came to burn down their temples, plunder their treasuries, pull down their statues and make a mockery of all their laws? Do the gods love criminals these days? No, they do not. But, gentlemen, there are men in this city, and I've noted them, a subversive faction, enemies of the state, a cell of oppositionists, call them what you will, who reject the laws and my leadership. They meet in secret and nod and whisper and talk of the great day. Seditious men they are. And they are behind this. Any fool can see that. Their bribery has suborned my soldiers and paid for this demonstration against my authority. Money, gentlemen. Money. The virus that infects mankind with every sickness we have a name for. No greater scourge than that. Money it is that pounds great cities into piles of rubble, turns people by the millions into homeless refugees, takes honest citizens, and corrupts them into doing things they'd be ashamed to think of before the fee was mentioned, and in the end, brings them into the execution chamber. Well... Whoever they are, these men who have sold themselves, they'll find the price considerably higher than they thought it was. You, come here. Come here! <laughs> by Zeus, whom I regard as my personal patron, and by all the gods men worship anywhere, I swear to you, soldier, that either you will find the man who buried Polynices' body in defiance of my express command, bring him here to me, the actual man who sprinkled the earth, no other will do, standing here in front of me. Hmm? Or you, soldier, will die for it. <laughs> Jack, I promise you, will be the least of your punishments. You will be made a public example and interrogated by the security police. Kept standing, beaten across the feet, the whole repertoire of special techniques at which we excel so much. Until you confess the full range of this conspiracy. Who paid you? How much, and for what purpose? The choice is yours. Perhaps that indicates where your own best interests lie. Crimes against the state and its laws, you'll find, are very unprofitable in the end. Am I allowed to speak, sir? Now, why should you speak? Every word you say is painful to me. Well, it can't be here, eh, can it, sir? Not what I said. It must stick in your gullet, or further down, maybe. A sort of pain in the conscience. Do you dare to answer me back and make jokes about my conscience? Well, me, sir? No, sir. I might give you earache. I can see that. I talk too much, always have done. But the other pain, the heartburn, as it were, it's the criminal causing that, sir, not me. Not short of a quick answer, either. No, sir. But I didn't bury the body. Not guilty to that, sir. Maybe guilty of selling your eyes for money, eh, Sentry? Looking the other way for cash? Oh, you're an intelligent man, sir, and well-educated, and I'm not. But in this case... I'm thinking clearly, and you're mistaken. You can think what you like. Whatever you think. If you fail to find this enemy of the state and bring him here to me, you'll find that money, from whatever source, will certainly not save your life. Well, let's hope they find him then, whoever he is. <laughs> I'm sure of. They won't find me. I never thought I'd get out of here alive. But when I do get out, nothing will bring me back again. 
I've had an amazing stroke of luck. And I won't chance my arm a second time. Is there anything more wonderful on Earth? A marvelous planet and the miracle of man. The more arrogant ease he rides the dangerous seas from the wave's towering summit to the yawning trough beneath. The Earth Mother herself, before time began, the oldest of the ageless gods, learned to endure his driving plough, turning the earth and breaking the clods, till, by the sweat of his, his brow, she yielded up her fruitfulness. The quick-witted birds are no match for him, neither victim nor predator among the beasts of the plain, nor the sea's seething masses. His cunning surpasses their instinct. His skill is the greater. His snares never fail and his nets teem. The wild bull of the savage mountain and the magnificent stag who passes like a king through upland and glen. The untamed horse with his matted tresses uncut on his neck. All submit to man and the yoke and the bit and his power increases. He has mastered the mysteries of language and thought which moves faster than the wind he has tamed and made rational. Political wisdom, too, all the knowledge of peoples and states. All the practical art of government he has studied and refined. Built cities to shelter his head against rain and danger and cold. And ordered all things in his mind. There is no problem he cannot resolve by the exercise of his brains or his breath. And the only disease he cannot salve or cure is death. In action, he is subtle beyond imagination, limitless in his skill. And these gifts are both enemies and friends, as he applies them with equal determination to good or to evil ends. All men honor, and the street uplifts that man to the heights of glory, whose powers uphold the Constitution and the gods and their laws. His city prospers. But if he shifts his ground and takes the wrong path, despising morality and blown up with pride, indulges himself and his power, at my hearth may he never ever warm himself or sit at my side. Wait, I can't believe my eyes. Can this be true? This is Antigone. I recognize her as clearly as I can see you. Her father's destiny was suffering and pain. On all his progeny, misfortunes reign. Child, did you openly disobey the new king's order? And bury your brother. Do you have to manhandle her this way? We saw it! Actually burying the body! Caught him in the act, as they say, red-handed. Only it's not a him, it's a her! Where's the king? He has been informed. He's on his way. Is this a moment to disturb the king? Why do you need me? What has happened? Lord Crown, I reckon it's always unwise to swear oaths and make promises, even to yourself. Second thoughts, nine times out of ten, will have their say and end up by calling you a liar. It's no time at all since I promised myself I wouldn't be seen dead here again. You were that angry with me the last time. A right mouthful you gave me. More than enough, thanks very much. But you can't beat a real turn up for the book, can you? There's nothing more enjoyable than a good win when you're expecting a towsing. So, here I am again, as the comic said, and my promise is not worth the air they were spoken with. This lady's your criminal. We caught her doing it, actually setting the grave to rights. I brought her here, and there was no panic this time, I can tell you. No retribution or drawing lots, she was all mine. I caught her, and I claim the credit for it. And now she's all yours. Take her, an accuser. Stone her to death, if you like. I'm free to go, I hope, and well shot of all of it. Where did you arrest her? Tell me the details. She was burying him. What else is there to say? Are you out of your mind? Do you realize the implications of what you're saying? Sir, she was burying the body. The body you ordered not to be buried. I can't speak plainer than that. But how did you catch her? Was she doing it openly? Well, gentlemen, it was like this. 
As soon as I got back, remembering all those threats or promises you made me, we brushed all the earth off the naked body, which was all wet and beginning to decay by now, and we sat up on the ridge, well to the windward of the stink, and we all kept a sharp eye on each other, ready to nudge anyone who dropped off and tear him off a strip too. For hours we sat there, till about midday. The sun was smack overhead, blazing down, and the heat was something terrible, I can tell you. Then suddenly, it was as though a whirlwind blew up. Definitely a twister it was, but localised like. And it raised up a dust storm which swept along the valley, tore all the leaves over the trees, blotted out the whole sky and completely blinded us. It seemed like some terrible manifestation of the gods, and you had to shut your eyes to endure it at all. And then suddenly, it stopped. And when the air had cleared, we opened our eyes and saw this girl standing there beside the grave and sort of wailing as though she were in pain or maybe anger. Just like a bird that comes back to the nest and finds the egg smashed or the fledglings gone. That's what it sounded like. She was standing there looking at the naked body and screaming and cursing the monsters who had done such a thing. Us, of course. Then she crouched down and picked up a few handfuls of the dry dust and scattered it on him. She carried an urn, a small bronze ceremonial thing, and she poured it over the dead man three times. Honey and wine and stuff it in, I suppose. All the proper ritual for a funeral anyway. Well, as soon as we saw that, we all came charging down and arrested her on the spot. She wasn't frightened or anything. She stood her ground. So then we formally charged her with the crime. This and the one before. And she admitted she'd done them both. <laughs> we were all relieved to hear that, I can tell you. But sorry, too, in a way. It's very nice to get out of trouble yourself. Not so nice when you see someone else up to the neck in it. Someone you've got no quarrel with. But still, your own life comes first, I reckon. You've got to look after number one. to this accusation hmm? you admit it you guilty or not yes I'm guilty I don't pretend otherwise you soldier get out you're free to go back to your unit count yourself lucky now tell me a simple yes or no did you hear of my order forbidding the burial? Of course I heard it. How could I not? Yet you dared to disobey the law. Yes, I did. Because it's your law, not the law of God. Natural justice, which is of all times and places numinous, not material, a quality of Zeus, not of kings, recognizes no such law. You are merely a man, mortal, like me. And laws that you enact cannot overturn ancient moralities or common human decency. They speak the language of eternity, are not written down, and never change. They are for today, yesterday, and all time. No one understands where they came from, but everyone recognizes their force, and no man's arrogance or power can make me disobey them. I would rather suffer the disapproval and punishment of men than dishonor such ancient truths. I shall die, of course, sometime. Whether you make laws or not, if my death comes sooner rather than later, I shall welcome it. My life has been misery, is misery now, and I shall be more than happy to leave it. There will be no pain and no despair in that. But to leave my mother's son out there in the open, Unburied! That would have been unendurable. I could not have borne it. Whereas this, I shall endure. By your judgment, of course, I'm a fool. But by mine, the judge is the criminal, not the accused. This is her father talking. Stubborn! Like him, she won't give way. Not even with the whole power of the state against her. Well, we shall see. 
any man can be broken, and often the most committed and determined break soonest. Even iron, you know, left lying in the fire too long becomes over-tempered and will snap as soon as a little pressure is applied. You can break it in pieces. And the wildest horse, in the end, submits to the bit and halter just like the rest. People without power, ordinary citizens, must necessarily obey those in authority over them. This woman is very proud. That was obvious in the first place when she broke the law and is even clearer now. She glories in the crime she has committed and insults me to my face as well as ignoring my decree. If she is allowed to flout the law in this way, all authority in the state will collapse. I will not have that. There will be no exchanging of roles here, me playing the woman while she plays the king. She is my niece, my sister's child. But I am the law, and that responsibility is above kinship. Were she even closer, the closest, my own daughter, my duty would be plain. Well, the law has its weapons, and they will strike at her, and at her sister, too, her accomplice, I've no doubt in this illegal act, to the full extent of the punishment prescribed. The other one is Mamie. Bring her here. I saw her in the corridor talking to herself some moments ago, and I suppose in tears. Guilty consciences, you see, can never be hidden completely. The human face reveals conspiracies before they are enacted again and again. There's nothing more disgusting than the confessed criminal who tries to justify his actions as this woman has done here today. I'm bored with your talk. Kill me and have done with it. Oh, there's no hurry. The progress of the law is majestic and inexorable, and that satisfies me. Why waste so much time? Nothing you say will be of the slightest interest to me, and my arguments you will not listen to. I've done what I said I'd do. I've buried my brother. I aspire to no greater honor. And if I am to be famous, let it be for that. All these, these senators of yours, they all agree with me in their hearts, but there's no gag like terror, is there, gentlemen? And kings must have their way, both in word and action, one way or the other. You're quite mistaken. None of my subjects anywhere in the city thinks as you do. They all do, but they're too afraid to speak. Not at all, and you should be ashamed setting yourself up against the majority, disregarding the will of the people. I love my brother. I honor him dead as I loved him living. There's no shame in that. The one he murdered, wasn't he your brother? My mother bore them both, and I love them both. If you honor one, you insult the other. Neither of those dead men would say that. It you please would. His brother was a traitor. Does he merit no greater respect than that? But he was not an animal! They both died together, and they were both men. Yeah, the one died defending his country while the other traitorously attacked it. They have their rights, and we have our duties towards them, dictated by common decency. And if good and bad are to be honored equally, where are our values? Patriotism, civic duty? Death is another country. Such things may not be valued there, may even be crimes. An enemy is still an enemy, dead or alive. No, I don't think so. I have love enough to share. No hate for anyone. Very well. Share your love by all means. Share it with the dead. I wish them well of it. Women must learn to obey as well as men. They can have no special treatment. Law is law and will remain so while I am king. And no woman will get the better of me. Is many guardian. Her face is raw with tears. Half dragged from her quarters. You can see the story in her face. A lifetime of agonies. And fears. The bitter legacy of Oedipus daughters. And you, snake, slithering silently about my house to drink my blood in secret. Both of you the same. I looked the other way, and like terrorists, you laid undercover plans to destroy me. You, do you confess your complicity in this crime or protest your innocence? Yes, I confess. If she will allow me to say so. I was fully involved and if she is guilty, so am I. No! That isn't justice! When I asked for help, you refused me, so I told you I didn't want you. I'd do it alone. But now that you're in danger, Antigone, I'm proud to stand beside you in the dock. The dead man knows who buried him. They all know down there. What people say doesn't impress me, only what they do. Please, my sister, don't despise me. 
Let me share the honor and die with you. You've no right to claim the honor for doing what you were afraid to do. One death will be enough. Why should you die? Because I can't live without you. Ask Crayon to help you. He's your uncle. And your king, of course. You're a born subject. Do I deserve such contempt? Do you enjoy making fun of me? Sneering in front of all these people? You're right. It's a sad reflection on me if such bitter pleasures are all I have left. Well, let me help you then. It's not too late. Save your own life. Do that for yourself without any criticism from me or envy. For God's sake, Antigone, will you not let me even die with my sister? No, I won't. You chose to live when I chose to die, and that's the end of it. But I warned you this would happen. I knew how it would be. And most the majority would agree with you, but some would be of my opinion. But now we're both accused, both sentenced. No. You must live. I have been dead for a long time, inwardly. I am well suited to pay honour to the dead and die for it. These women are neurotic lunatics, both of them. One of them going off her head before her eyes, the other one born unbalanced. Well, are you surprised? Anyone would crack the most tough-minded person under such treatment. You lost your senses when you allowed yourself to be influenced by her lunacy. There's no life for me here, not without her. She's not here. She's as good as dead. Will you kill the woman your son plans to marry? There are other women, no lack of choice for a young man. Other fields to plough. They're devoted to each other. You can't change love as you change your clothes. No son of mine can marry a criminal. When Hyman hears how his father insults... Let him hear. What does his mistress matter to me? My lord Crayon, you insult your own. They are formally betrothed. Will you tear the woman from your own son's arms? I will not part them. Death will. If that's how the land lies, the poor child's doomed. Her death warrant sealed and delivered. By you, gentlemen, if you remember, as well as by me. You heard the order, agreed it with me, if only by your silence, did you not, before the criminal was known. We'll have no more shilly-shallying. Take them away, lock them up, keep them under close guard. It's time they understood they are women and their proper place in this society. There's nothing like the immediate threat of death to soften up their rhetoric, make them look reality in the face. But when one unlucky family incurs the gods' malignity, from generation to generation, they must swallow the bitter potion again and then again. Just as rollers crash and sea spray whips on an exposed beach and black clouds lower and the gale from the north screams through frozen lips while the sea casts up from its depths a shower of pebbles on the shore. And black sand from the chasms of ocean darkens the strand. On every descendant of the ancient line of Labdacus, divine and merciless retribution falls. In the unremembered past, some unforgiving Olympian cast the weight of his vengeance on the whole race. So that agony, destruction, disgrace, destroys son and daughter, and darkens their halls with tragedy. The cold hands of the dead reach out for the living and no one is spared. Another generation sheds its blood. New light is snuffed out. And the young root bared for the same bloody axe. The characteristic sin of Oedipus, arrogance, brings its bleak harvest in. For Zeus is all-powerful. No man can match him. He never sleeps as man must sleep. And time, which leaves its mark on fair complexions and dark, can never engrave his face or dim the brightness of his palace where the gods keep their ageless court at the utmost peak of sublime Olympus. Zeus is master there, and well did that wise man speak, who said that past and future time he holds in his hand by right. And that those who climb in their greatness or wickedness beyond the permitted height, he brings to destruction and despair. But all men hope, and some have ambition. Far-ranging birds that never tire, 
whose wings bear some to their own good. And others in a more frivolous mood to the brightly lit pathway that leads to destruction and disaster and the merciless fire. And no man can claim to have understood hope or ambition till the flames burn under his feet. And the one solid root of his life is reduced to its last condition. Ashes and dust. A wise man said from out of the depths of his inspiration, when a man commits crimes and is proud of the action, a flaming sword hangs over his head. No future but at the grave and at a funeral urn. Comes your youngest son, desperate with grief that his future bride should be so brutally denied. And all his hopes of happiness gone. For the last of your sons, what relief from his consuming fears and the bitter penance of tears. Does he come to beg for mercy for his beloved Antigone? We shall learn that from his own lips without any need of fortune tellers. My dear son, I don't doubt you've heard the news of our final decision. The condemnation of your former fiancé. You come here, I hope, not in any spirit of anger against your father, but understanding that we are always comrades, and my love for you is unshaken. I know I'm your son, father. I understand the depth of your experience in matters of state, and I try to follow and benefit from it whenever I can. Any marriage would be worthless to me that didn't have your approval and love. Good fellow. Well said. The father's opinion should always be influential with his sons. And fathers with young sons, when they pray for them, ask especially that they should grow up to be loyal, reliable, obedient. The first to strike at their father's enemies, just as they are the first to support his friend. A father whose sons yield no such profits from the investment of his parenthood, breeds grief and sorrow as his offspring and becomes himself a figure of fun, especially to his enemies. Don't be taken in, boy. Don't let any woman ensnare you by exploiting her sexuality or any of the attractions that lure infatuated men into submission. God help the lovesick fool who marries a dominating woman. Passion never lasts. And a cold bedroom breeds cold hearts, anger and bitterness. For there's no hatred so violent as the hatred of two people who were once in love. Get rid of her, my boy. This girl's an enemy, no good to you or your best interests. Kick her out. Let her find herself a husband that suits her among the dead. <laughs> Don't deceive yourself. She has been openly apprehended performing a criminal act against the state. She's a confessed traitor. But if I were to spare her life, I too would betray the state and its law and everything I stand for. I will not do it. And she must die. Let her pray to Zeus till she drops. Let her assert she stands for family, love and ancient virtues and all the rest of it. If I tolerate treachery in my own house under my very nose, how can I crush subversion anywhere else in the city or in the state at large? The man who rules wisely within his own family is more likely to make sensible judgments in political matters, in his direction of the state, to pervert the law, to twist it, to serve one's own ends or the interests of one's relations. That cannot be allowed, neither in states nor in cities, and will not be allowed by me in any circumstances. Unquestioning obedience to whomsoever the state appoints to be its ruler is the law, as far as I'm concerned. And this applies to small things as well as great ones, just or unjust, right or wrong. For who is to choose these things but the king? The man who is wise in his direction of his family will be equally firm in power. His wisdom will be equally remarkable, whether as king or indeed as subject. In times of war and national danger, he will be the man you can rely on. 
the man you'd feel safe with fighting beside you in the front rank when the battle becomes critical. Indiscipline, anarchy, disobedience. What greater scourge than that for humankind? States collapse from within, cities are blown to rubble, efficient armies are disorganized, and potential victory turned to disaster and carnage, and all by disobedience, anarchy, indiscipline, whereas the well-conditioned army that asks no questions stands firm, knows nothing, needs to know nothing, and wins, thus saving the lives of millions of honest people. Authority is essential in any state and will be upheld in this one by me. There will be no yielding to female fantasies, not by so much as an inch. And if we must be deposed, let it be by a man's hand, eh, son? Not by a conspiracy of women. If an old man is fit to be judged, Lord Crayon, you have spoken rationally, sensibly, and with the wisdom gathered from long experience. Father, the most enviable of a man's gifts is the ability to reason clearly. And it's not for me to say you're wrong, even if I were clever enough or experienced enough, which I'm not. But it's also true to say that some men think differently about these things. And as your son, my most useful function, it seems to me, is to keep you in touch with what other people are thinking, what they say and do and approve or disapprove of, and sometimes what they leave unsaid. The prospect of your disapproval is a great silencer of most men's tongues, and some things are never said for fear of the consequences, but I can sometimes hear what people whisper behind their hands. And everywhere I hear sympathy expressed for this unfortunate girl, condemned as she is to a horrifying death which no woman has ever suffered before, and unjustly in most people's eyes. In burying her brother, who was killed in action, she did something that most people consider decent and honorable, rather than leaving him naked on the battlefield for the dogs to tear at and kites and scavengers to pick to the bone. She should be given a medal for it, those same people say, and her name inscribed on the roll of honor. These things are whispered in secret, Father, and they've reached my ears. Sir, your reputation matters to me as much as your good health and happiness does. Indeed, your good name matters more. What could a loving son be more jealous of than his father's reputation? And what could please a father more than to see his son's concern that people will think well of him? Then let me beg you to have second thoughts and not be certain that your own opinion is the only right one and that all men share it. The man who thinks he has the monopoly of wisdom and that only what he says and what he thinks is of any relevance reveals his own shallowness of mind with every word he says. The man of judgment knows it's a sign of strength not weakness, to value others' opinions and to learn from them, and when he's wrong, to admit it openly and change his mind. You see it when a river floods. The trees that bend survive. Those whose trunks are inflexible are snapped off short by the weight of water. And a sailor in a storm who refuses to reef his sail and run with the wind is likely to end up capsized. I beg you, Father, Think twice about this. Don't let your anger influence you. If a man of my age may lay some small claim to common sense, let me say this, absolute certainty is fine. If a man can be certain that his wisdom is absolute. But such certainty and such wisdom is rare among men. And that being so, the next best is to learn to listen and to take good advice when it's offered. There's a lot of sense, my Lord Crayon, in what this young man has said, as indeed there was in everything that you said, too. The fact is, you are both in the right, and there's a good deal to be said for either. Is there indeed? Am I expected to listen and take lessons in political tactics at my age from a mere boy? I'm a man, Father, and my arguments stand upon their merits, not my age. I am for common justice, no more than that. Oh, they stand upon their merits, do they? Well, what merit is there, please tell me, in breaking the law? I wouldn't defend her if she'd broken the law. But she has broken it openly, fragrantly. Listen to the people in the streets, Father. 
The ordinary Thebans, they say she I has... I have never based my political principles on the opinions of people in the street. Now you're the one who's speaking like a boy. I am speaking like a king. It is my decision. I will act according to my own conviction. When the state becomes one man, it ceases to be a state. The state is the statesman who rules it. It reflects his judgment. It belongs to him. Don't rule in the desert, then. There's no one there to argue with you. What a king you'll be there. This boy of mine is on the women's side. Yes, if you're a woman, I am. I'm on your side, father, you know that. You damned impertinent devil. Every word you say is against me, your own father. Well, I know you're wrong, I have to speak. How am I wrong? By maintaining my position on the authority of the state, is that wrong? When position and authority ride roughshod of a moral field. You're weak and uxorious and contemptible with no will of your own. Yet a woman's mouthpiece. I'm not ashamed of what I'm saying. Every word you've said pleads for her. I plead for you. And for myself and for common humanity. Respect for the dead. You will never marry that woman, never. Not this side of the grave. If she dies, she won't die alone. There'll be two deaths, not one. Are you threatening me? How dare you threaten me? No, that's not a threat. I'm telling you, your plan was misbegotten from the beginning. Misbegotten? Dear God, if anything's misbegotten here, it's my son. You'll regret this, I promise you. If you were my father, I'd say you were demented. Don't father me. Get a woman's plaything, a tame laptop. Is anyone else allowed to speak? Must you have the last word in everything? Must all the rest of us be gagged? I must. And I will. And you, I promise you, will regret what you've spoken here today. I will not be sneered at or contradicted by anyone. Sons can be punished too. Bring her out, the condemned woman, the criminal. Let her die here and now in front of him. This passionate bridegroom of hers. You can watch the execution. That's one sight I shall never see. Nor from this moment. Father, will you ever see me again? Those that wish to stay and watch this disgusting spectacle of tyranny and injustice are welcome to it. And old Prem, your son has gone so desperate and in such a hurry, I am afraid for him. When young men are angry, anything is possible. Let him go. Let him do as he pleases. Let him rave himself senseless. It's all noise and nonsense. The two women are sentenced. It'll take more than that to reprieve them, I promise you. Both of them, son? You mean to put both of the sisters to death? No, you're right. I can take advice. The one who covered the body, not the other. And for the condemned one? What manner of death? Take her to some lonely place, a desert unfrequented by anyone. Find a cave and wall her up in it. Bury her alive! But with just enough food so that no guilt for her death will fall upon us, neither state nor city, she'll have plenty of time to honor the gods of the dead there, since they receive so many of her prayers. <laughs> They will release her one way or the other, and she will learn that worshipping the dead is not the business of the living. When the god of unbridled passion makes war, he always wins. No force on earth can withstand his powerful, merciless hand. When the first flowers appear in the young girl's cheeks, the remorseless magic begins. And then, and from the, the deepest, deepest valley to the highest peak, his traps are set. And no man's sins or virtues can keep him from the net. The mania is universal. But the gods themselves run mad. Men lose their wits, and, and no one is spared. When, when the madness strikes, no one is safe. The maturest of men will commit follies and crimes undreamed of in saner times. What else could provoke this strife between father and son? This family divided, and murderous anger between kin. There is fire in a woman's eye, incited by such consuming heat. A man's mind can burn. Aphrodite shares powers with Zeus. Her seat is at his right hand. The lightning strikes to the heart, and its power is frightening.
Yet how can we talk of justice and the needs of the state while we stand and watch this unendurable sight? My eyes will have their way and weep, seeing Antigone, calm as a bride, going to her bedchamber to marry the dead and share their everlasting sleep. gentlemen. This place has been my home. I was born in this city. And now I begin my last journey. I look up at the sun in its familiar sky and feel its warmth on my face, only to say goodbye. In the daytime of my life, in mid-breath, this security policeman death arrests me as he arrests everyone, young and old, at home or in the street, to the cold waters of darkness we come, never to return across that silent river. No wedding for me, no music, no guests in the room. My wedding gift is eternity in a stone tomb, my dowry forever not to be. Death, my bridegroom, but your action is famous. In every street, mouths whisper Antigone. You go down to the dead with the promise of glory ringing in your head. And nothing to devalue your beauty. No sword has scarred you. Plague visited. Unmarked, untouched, you pass from the dangerous light into the safety of eternal night. Alive, alone, and free. Do you remember the sad story of Tantalus' daughter? She was a stranger from Phrygia, unmarried like me, in danger like mine. She was sentenced to die on the rock of Sipolis, and there was no glory for her. Only the endless shock of the elements and the terrible place where she was imprisoned. The mountains embraced like fingers of ivy, tying her down, enclosing, entombing her. And she all alone while the snows blinded her and the freezing rain whipped her to rags and exposed her pain to the naked sky. What bitter tears she shed as she slowly turned to stone and the grey rock petrified her by inches. And she died. Her story is mine. Today I shall share her rocky bed. But she was a goddess, not born for death like the children of men, whose desperate mortality is their only certainty. Would it soothe your pain to share her destiny? Or soften your distress as, alive in the earth, you draw your last breath like her to be living again? Are you laughing at me? Why everything this city of our fathers has ever held sacred? You landowners! You elder statesmen! You rulers of Thebes! My dying is no joke! Am I a figure of fun to be mocked like this? And publicly humiliated as I leave you forever? Then, forests and meadows and our Theban river Glittering pathways, ceaselessly flowing from Dursi's death till now. Flat lands thundering beneath our chariots. You must be my witnesses, my only friends and mourners. As victimized by an unjust law, I go to my last home in the living tomb to wait. While the slow darkness descends. Cold and starving on my stony bed. Halfway between the living and the dead. No one has ever dared to go so far before as you have dared to go. Now you have stumbled and stubbed your toe that will shortly shed your blood on the marble staircase of the law. You carry your father's crimes like a millstone on your back. Small wonder in such times if the bones bend or break. 
Nothing more painful than that. The remembrance of my father's long agony. And the curse on my suffering family from the beginning. So much grief from the unlucky chance of the son finding the mother's bed. And worse than anything, the benighted offspring of that unspeakable marriage. And I, with the others, share that terrible destiny. Conceived in incest, no repentance can soften the punishment. The years pass, the agony increases. And there is no pity for our tears, no marriage for me, for certain. I shall close that book forever as I meet my mother and father in the shades. The weddings will cease. Marriage to the woman of Argos finished my brother and finished me too. There will never be another. To pay respect to the dead is praiseworthy, an act of love, and religion must have its due. But no civilized state can eschew authority. Laws must be obeyed, whether you approve or disapprove. You refuse to sanction the power of the state. You invite disaster and connive at your own fate. Spare me your sympathy. Weep no false tears. I know the path that I must follow to the sunless country of eternal <coughs> sorrow. The bleak waters of eternity. The unimaginable years. No grief where none is felt. I shall go alone and in silence to my house of stone. If death could be prevented by singing arias about it or other self-indulgent displays of grief, this performance would go on forever, I've no doubt. But I've had enough of it. Take her away, lock her up in her stone vault with half a mountain for a roof, and then break up the door. Let her die there if she chooses. Or if she prefers to stay alive in her grave, she can, because the grave's the only fit place for her. Solitary confinement among the dead. Whatever she does, there will be no guilt on me or on the city. <laughs> her death's her own. But there's no place for her among the living. To my grave, then. My honeymoon bed. My prison. My crypt under the mountain. My home for the rest of time. I shall meet so many of my relations there. We shall all be guests of that sad-faced queen of the shadows, Persephone, in that bleak hotel that is never short of a room. <laughs> I am the last. The unhappiest, I think. And the youngest, booking in too soon. But my father will be there to meet me at the door. My mother will smile and hold me as she often did. And my brother, he will be glad to see me more than all the rest. At each fresh grave, my hands sprinkled the earth. At each, I poured the purifying water and made offerings. Then for my beloved Polynices, whose broken body I set to rest, I am rewarded with a shameful death. There are some, I know, more thoughtful people who respect my action. They must justify me. Not for a husband, do you understand? Not even for a son would I have done this. If the law had forbidden it, I would have bowed my head and let them rot. Does that make sense? Well, I could have married again, another husband, had more children by him if the first had died, do you see? Well, do you understand me? My mother and father are dead. There can be no more brothers, never again. My love had to speak at Polynices' grave or nowhere. And for that, Crayon sentences me to death, drags me here and will shut me away in a cavern under the mountain. A living death in silence and darkness and solitude. I shall die unmarried. All those pleasures denied me. And motherhood denied too. No children to love me. To love. And now... No friends. What moral law have I broken? What eternal 
little truths have I denied. Yet now not even a god can help me. And there's no man who will, I'm sure of that. No help and no hope. How can there be when common decency has become a crime? If the gods in heaven have changed their minds and this is the way they order things now, I shall soon know it. And I shall have learned my lesson the hard way. But if some others are mistaken, let them be punished as I have been punished. No worse than that. And no less either. She hasn't changed, even now. The anger inside her still blows like a hurricane. The sooner she's got rid of, shut up out of harm's way and forgotten, the better. Tell those guards to get a move on or they'll regret it. That word is my death. And now it is spoken. Don't comfort yourself with hope. There's none. This is the land of my fathers. Thebes. Built by a god. You see, senators, my time has run out. There's no more left. I am the last of the royal blood, a daughter of kings, and I die his victim, unjustly, for upholding justice and the humanity of humankind. Others have suffered, my child, like you. Upon Danae, too, the same dreadful sentence was passed. Far from the light of day, in a tower of brass, she was shut away. And that one single room, both prison and tomb, became her wedding chamber at last. Like you, she was a child of kings. Yet in her womb, the semen of Zeus, descending in a golden shower, made a mockery of the brazen tower. Fate has its own momentum. When things must be, they will be. What use is power in the state or wealth? Massive armies, an unsinkable fleet. Gods make their entrances by strength or stealth. And no tombs or towers can keep them out. Sergius discovered wisdom when he angered the god Dionysus with his railing. That proud Edonian king was punished with madness and long imprisoned in a rocky cell to endure the private and particular hell of lunacy till the healing silence soothed and reordered his brain. He learned there the terrible power of the god he had challenged. Ecstasy is beyond, beyond man's understanding, understanding a, a mystery, mystery deeper than reason, which overcomes pain, pain and, and seeks truth in intoxication and terror. Only a fool would attempt to stop the menads in full flight or silence their ecstatic singing. The sea of reason is not darkness, but another kind of light. And where the gloomy rocks divide the seas in Thrace, by the Bosphorus, the savage god Ares laughed to see the sons of Phineus blinded with a spindle. Nothing could placate their vengeful stepmother's hate. Her bloody needle darkened their eyes forever, blinding the children as the gods had blinded the father. On their mother's wedding day, their destiny was settled. 
Their wasted lives they wept away in sightless misery. Yet she was descended from the gods. In the echoing caves of the north wind, she hallooed as a child. And on the open mountainside, ran wild with the horses. Man's fate it is determined, will not be denied. The child Antigone pays for the parent's pride. Senators of Thebes and your new King Creon, we have traveled together, my boy and I, sharing one pair of eyes between the two of us, which is the way blind men must make their journeys. Tiresias. What news brings an old man such a distance? Important news that can't wait. An advice which, if you're wise, you'll listen to. I've always listened, acted upon it two more than once. Like a sensible captain who values his pilot, you've avoided the rocks. I admit it, we all do. We're in your debt. Then for God's sake, listen to me now. You're like a man balanced on a razor, likely to fall or cut himself to pieces. Are you serious? Any man would shudder hearing such things from your lips that have foretold so many horrors. Tell me what you mean. Oh, yes, I intend to. Everything my experience of forecasting the future and understanding symbols revealed to me, I will make plain to you. I was sitting in my usual seat, a place where I can hear the singing and the secret language of the birds and understand their meaning, when I heard, quite unexpectedly, a terrible new sound, like shrieking or cries of anguish, hysterical twittering and whistling, like the babble of a barbaric language capable of expressing only hatred or pain. By that and the wild beating of wings, I knew the birds were at war. Such sounds could mean nothing else. I could well imagine their blood-stained beaks and dripping claws, and that thought disturbed me deeply. At once I went to my altar to see what I could learn from the sacrifice by fire, but nothing would burn. A stinking liquid fell from the flesh and dropped on the embers and sizzled and bubbled among the ashes. Then the gallbladder burst, spurting stinking acid across the meat, and all the flat melted and was rendered down till the bone was left bare. I saw all this, or oh, my boy saw it. He sees for me what my eyes cannot, just as I see things to which other people are blind. But from that filth I read nothing. The oracle was clogged with fat and decay, and then it was revealed. I understood that you, King Crayon, hath decreed this filth that chokes our altars. The blood and flesh which decays and stinks there is the blood and flesh vomited from the gullets of dogs and carrion crows. The blood of Polynices, the flesh of that unluckiest of the sons of Oedipus, still unburied and affronting more than our sense of smell. The gods themselves are disgusted. They reject our prayers and sacrifices. How could they do otherwise? How can the birds sing of anything but horrors blown out with this banquet of human blood, clogged and stinking till their very beaks drip with it? My son, listen to me. Any man can make a mistake or commit a crime. The man who can recognize what he has done see that he is mistaken and or morally wrong, admits it and puts it right. That man proves that there is never too late to become wise and no one will condemn him. But if he compounds his stupidity with stubbornness and an obstinate refusal to face the facts, he is nothing but a fool. Is there anyone more stupid than a stupid man who cannot see his own stupidity? Polynices is dead. Don't revenge yourself on his remains. You can kill a man once and once only. Is there any glory to be gained by defeating a poor corpse? This is good advice, my son. Sincerely offered by one who wishes you well. Take it. So that's your news, is it, old man? 
I am to be the target, am I, for everyone to shoot at? Well, I am wise, too. Wise to the ways of fortune tellers and the buying and selling you all go in for. <laughs> and I'm to be the latest bargain, I see. I am to be bought and sold like silver from the mines of Sardis or gold from India. I'm to be part of the trade. Well, let me tell you this, Tiresias. There is not enough gold in the world to buy a grave for that man. If golden eagles should carry him up by joints and shreds to Zeus and spew him in gobbets on the marble floor of Olympus, not even that blasphemy would be enough to deflect me from my purpose because I know that no single human act, however much it may degrade the earth and the men who perpetrate or suffer it, can stain the purity of the ever-living gods. But let me tell you this, Tyrese, yes. A man can fall. He can fall like a stone. Especially when he pretends to give good advice and wraps it up in a profound cloak of religiosity. When all the time, naked self-interest and the greed for profit are the only motives that matter to him. Are there any wise men left anywhere? Oh, how profound. Do you have any other thunderous platitudes to follow that one? Mature judgment cannot be bought. No treasure is as valuable. And good advice is worth more than a fortune to any man. Bad advice is worse than worthless. A disease which infects the wisest of men. You describe your own symptoms exactly. Well, then, my so-called prophet, tell me, will any of these insults be of any benefit to anyone? None at all. And yet you insult me. You say that my predictions are both false and dishonest. That is because all fortune tellers are money grubbers and charlatans. Kings, too, have been known to be acquisitive. Do you know the man you're speaking to? I am the king. You are the king, yes. My good advice helped to make you one. Oh, you've had your successes, I know that. You've been proved right on more than one occasion. But honesty is another matter. I've never trusted you. Don't provoke me to tell you everything. What do you mean? Everything I know. Say what you like. Say anything at all, but say it honestly, not for cash. Are you really foolish enough to believe that money has ever been my motive? Because my integrity is not for sale. Tell your buyer that, whoever he is. Listen, Creon, this is the truth. Before many more days, before the sun has risen, well, shall we say a few more times, you will have made your payment corpse for corpse with a child of your own blood. You have buried the one still living, the woman who moves and breathes you have given to the grave, and the man you have left unwashed, unwept, and without the common courtesy of a decent covering of earth, so that both have been wronged. And the gods of the underworld to whom the body justly belongs are denied it and are insulted. Such matters are not for you to judge. You usurp ancient rights which even the gods themselves don't dare to question, powers that are not within the prerogative of kings. Even now, this minute, the Avengers are on their way. The Furies, who rise up from hell and swoop down from heaven, fix their hooks in those who commit crimes and will never let go. The suffering that you inflicted on others will be inflicted upon you. You will suffer as they did. Have I been bribed, do you think? Am I speaking for money now? Before very long, yes, it will be soon, there will be screaming and bitter tears and hysterical crying in this house, men as well as women. Other cities too, other states will turn upon you for the crime you have committed. Dogs and vultures will swarm in the streets, dropping fragments of the unburied man in corners, on doorsteps, in the public squares. They will smell the pollution and turn to you, its author. That is all I have to say. You made me angry, Crayon, with your crude accusations. And so I made you my target. And like a good marksman, all my shots have hit the bull. You can feel them, can't you? You can feel the pain like an arrow here. Take me home now, boy. Leave him alone to entertain some younger ears than mine with his ridiculous outbursts. Either that 
or let him learn maturer judgments and how a wise man controls his tongue. My lord, he's gone promising nothing but disaster to come. My hair grew gray in this city. I was dark-haired here, soon I will be white. And in all that time, I have never known any of his prophecies to be proved wrong. Neither have I, man. I know that much as well as you. My mind's torn apart like a tug of war, one way than the other. How can I give way now? Yet how can I stand here like a fool and wait stubbornly for whatever it is that's coming? Lord Creon, it's time to take good advice. Give it then, don't be afraid, I'll listen. Release the woman from her underground prison. And give honorable burial to the dead man. So that's your advice. Total collapse, complete withdrawal. Do you all think that? We do, sir. And do it quickly, for heaven's sake. The gods never move faster than when punishing men with the consequences of their own actions. How can I do it? It's unendurable to deny every principle and every action I've stood fast by. Yet I dare not stand against the iron laws of necessity. Go on, sir. Do it now mm. and do it personally. Not by proxy with your own hand. Yes, I'll go. I'll go this instant. Somebody, anybody, bring spades and sledgehammers out onto the mountain. I'm coming with you. If I've changed my mind, I will act upon it with exactly the same determination. I sentenced her. And I'll set her free. Tear down bricks with my own hands if necessary. Perhaps it is wisest to let the old laws stand. My fear tells me it is. And that's a voice every prudent man must listen to. Mysterious Eleusis. Where all Greece dreams is most secret dream. Both praised and feared. This, this is, is your native city. city. Where the quiet river of Ismenus waters the meadows. Where the fever of ecstasy possesses your women folk. Your own thieves. thieves. Where the dragon's teeth whistle. The whole world the worships, worships you. Wine god, god intoxicator. On the two-pronged mountain, where the torches glitter, and the nymphs of Parnassus dance. By the pool where Castalia's suicide made the waters magical, and the cool draught inspires poets to frenzy, and the true waters of darkness reside. From the impenetrable slopes of Nysa, where the ivy runs wild, and the vines hang thick in your face, come home, Theban child! Let the world sing its hymns in vain! In, In the, the Theban streets, streets, hail, we shout, Bacchus, hail! And the city waits. Your mother, Semele, died here. Incinerated by the fire of the universe. Zeus in his splendor. Now in your city, another disaster threatens. Fear locks up our tongues. And like a plague sore on the face, the state's disease is made public. We have done wrong. No, the first necessity is for healing. From Parnassus' rocky scream. Or over the sighing waters of the endless sea. Come to us, healer, and heal. We have suffered too long. All the stars of the galaxy, whose hearts are fire, throb to your music. And, and the remote voices of measureless night Sweet from the depths of their mystery. Come with your praised followers, your lunatic women, the wild Venus, authentic son of Zeus. Bring delight and dancing till we drop. Bring rest, bring peace, bring healing and rebirth.
Descendants of Cadmus who founded our city and Amphion who built it. Good people of Thebes. No man's life ever moves smoothly according to plan. Who can make judgments? Say this is praiseworthy in human existence and this is to be despised when chance rules everything. One moment a man rides high on his fortune and the same moment he crashes to the depths. Luck, like the tide, is certain to ebb after the flow. And no man can tell what will happen tomorrow. Everyone surely envied Creon. He had brought his country out of anarchy, taken power as king, and his position in the state was unchallenged. What's more, he ruled well. If firmly and his son was at his side to help and succeed him. All that is over now. What life can there be when the things that make life pleasant are all destroyed? A kind of death, moving and breathing, but not living. That's how it is for him. Of course, he's rich beyond accounting. He's a king still with all the pomp and circumstance that rank implies. But what's it worth when all the joy of life is gone? A shadow, a mockery, a vulgar pageant. Who can take pleasure in wealth or power when all happiness is dead in his heart? More tragedy for this family. Tell us your news. They're both dead. And the living must take the blame. Who's dead? Who killed them? What happened? Tell us. The king's son, Hymen. The royal blood shed by a royal hand. His father, you mean? Or his own? His own held the sword. But his father's actions drove it home. The prophet warned us. And it all came true. That's how things are. It's in your hands now. The door is opening. Look. Here's Eurydice, poor woman. The king's wife. Does she know, do you think? Has she come here by chance? Or because she has heard her son is dead. Gentlemen, good friends, my ears caught something of what you were saying. It was a few words as I opened the door. I was on my way to offer prayers to Pallas Athene. We had just drawn back the bolt when I heard a few scraps of your conversation. It's enough to make me fear what all mothers fear, an accident or some disaster to those we love. I nearly fainted. My ladies-in-waiting caught me in their arms. Please, speak it out plainly, whatever it is, I can bear it. We are bred to stoicism in this family. Dear Queen, whom we all respect, I was there, I saw it all, and I'll tell you exactly what happened. There's no point in trying to soften the blow now, only to be proved a liar later. It's best to tell the truth. I went with the King, your husband, to the edge of the battlefield, where we saw the body of Polynices still lying where he fell and in a terrible state. The dogs had been at him. So we prayed. First to Hecate, who haunts crossroads and tombs and the scenes of crimes committed but not atoned for, and then to Pluto, king of the dead. We asked them to have pity on him and on us, and not to be angry. Then we washed him, or what was left of him, with holy water, cut fresh branches to make a pyre, and burned the remains. Then we shoveled a mound of his own Theban earth over the ashes. And as soon as we'd done that, we hurried off as fast as we could to the prison cell under the mountain that served as a bridal suite for the girl married to death. But before we arrived, one of the soldiers with the unenviable job of guarding that godforsaken place came running back to tell the king that he'd heard a terrible noise like screaming from inside the mountain. And as Crayon got nearer, he heard it too, faint but audible, a kind of weird screaming or moaning, low and unearthly as though Grief was speaking its own naked language. When the king heard it, he groaned aloud. And we all heard him say, Oh God, this is what I was afraid of. Am I a prophet too? This path up to the tomb, these last few steps, is the most agonizing journey I shall ever make. I can hear my son's voice in there. 
You, quickly, guards, anybody, get in there. Squeeze between the rocks where somebody has already forced an entrance. Get into the main chamber of the cave. And tell me if it is my son's voice I recognized, or whether the gods are playing some cruel trick with me. So we went in and looked, as the half-crazed king had told us to, and there, in the darkest corner, we saw her, strung up by the neck hanging from an improvised rope of twisted linen strips torn from her own dress. Hyman was right beside her, cuddling her body as it dangled there, and sobbing brokenheartedly at his wife's death. And the marriage, bad luck, and his father's cruelty had made certain would never take place. When Crayon saw them, he staggered into the cave, crying like a child and sobbed aloud, my boy, my poor boy, what are you doing here? And then, have you gone mad coming here? There's nothing here for you but death and annihilation and despair. Come away from there, my son, I'm begging you, come away for God's sake, come away! The boy just looked at him, and his eyes were terrifying, with an anger like I've never seen before. Without a word, he spat in his father's face and drew his sword and lunged straight for the old man. But Crane was quick and skipped out of distance, and the poor lad, hysterical with grief, braced his sword against a rock and thrust himself upon it so fiercely it pierced his belly and came out through his back. There was blood everywhere. His life flooded away before our eyes as he clutched the dead girl. Then his arms slowly slackened. And the pumping blood soaked her body so that her dead cheek flushed red again with the blood stain. So. Now they're together, two corpses, married at last, whom death hath joined no man can put asunder. They look like honeymooners together in one bed. Evidence that the havoc man can bring upon man by his own pig-headedness and arrogance. Just a moment. The queen has gone without a word. Giving no indication of her feelings one way or the other. I'm sure she had good reasons. A public demonstration of grief would be unlike her. She'll suffer like any other mother for her son's death, but in private with her women. She'd never do anything foolish or indiscreet, I'm sure of that. She's far too sensible. I hope you're right. Her silence was unnerving. Dangerously unlike what one would expect. That kind of silence is sometimes more frightening than screaming or tears. I'll go in after her. Just to make sure that grief doesn't tempt her to anything silly or excessive. You're right, the silence was unnerving. She seemed to feel nothing. And in my opinion, that can be dangerous. Look there, the, the king, king is coming, coming. but not alone. A silent witness comes before him, dead as stone. The unspeaking evidence that the crime, like the grief, is all his own. He suffers now for his wrongdoing. hatred inside me 
The urge to destroy drove me like a maniac, an insane plunge towards death. Your death, my boy. See here the victim and his killer. See here the father and his son. I was responsible. My actions killed him. There is no blame for him. None. Blasted in the morning of your life. My hope, my joy, my hand powered the knife. My arrogance determined your fate. You see the truth now, but you see it too late. Suffering is the only school teacher. The gods have broken my back, whipped me like a beast up this stony track and destroyed my self-respect. All pleasure, all rejoicing, they have turned to anguish and weeping. Man is a naked mortal creature. Affliction is all he can expect. My lord, you have suffered enough but more suffering is marked to your name. One agony lies here in the open, another is waiting. The same anguish redoubled behind the door. There can be nothing worse. My heart is broken. Not your wife, the mother of this slaughtered son. Her wound is still fresh, but the breath of life is gone. Hades is deep, bottomless, the abyss of the dead. Will you kill me again or bring me to my knees to suffer longer, beating my head insensible with pain? What can you say, messenger of death, with a sad face more than you've said already? My way is towards the darkness. My case can be no worse than it is. Can you kill me again? I'm dead already. Will there be more blood? More hacking of flesh? More savagery, more pain. First the son, then the mother. No end to this grief. Open the door and see for yourself. Unendurable pain. This is the second time I'm forced to see what no man's eyes should ever see, even once. Is this how it ends? Or will there be more torture, more suffering? A few moments ago, my trembling arms embraced the dead son. Now grief has snatched the mother from my hand. It was there by the household shrine she stood, still holding the razor-sharp knife and as darkness drew down its slow blinds and her eyes closed. She spoke of Megaris, who died in the fullness of his youth, her elder boy. Nothing but good was ever said of him. And she wept for the son whose life ended today and with her last dying breath cursed you as his murderer who drove him to this death. I think I shall go mad with terror. There must be a sword somewhere, a sharp two-edged knife to cut away my life. Living is misery for me now, forever. When I look, I see blood everywhere. It's no more than the truth I've told. Her last word was to blame you for both deaths, mother and son. How did she die? Did she do it alone? She heard them weeping. For Hymen cried aloud and skewered herself with her own small sword. She spoke the truth. All the guilt is mine. I am the murderer. Make that plain. Somebody Anybody, take me away. I disgrace the decent light of day. I am nothing now. I have become nothing. Nothing can happen to the man who is nothing. How can we judge the best in times like these? Prompt action is safest. What more is there to lose? I look for a friend now. 
The shadowy messenger who runs swifter than the wind to wrap me in darkness as a friend should. Why waste another day? What good is daylight to me? Why should my misery darken the face of another dawn? Pull down the blind. Tomorrow is a mystery. mystery. No, no man, man can, can say what time will be clean. We live day by day. The future is in greater hands than ours. I am nothing. I want nothing. My last, simplest prayers. Prayers are a waste of time. Why pray? What, what must come, come will come. Tomorrow or today. I am nothing. Take me then, the man who killed without knowing it, his wife and son. Where should I go then? Left or right, all wrong turnings now. Into the night. Darkness hide me. There is blood on my hands. My head is split. My back is broken. I should be dead. Human happiness is to nurture wisdom in your heart. For man to attend to man's business and let the gods play their part. Above all, to stand in awe of the eternal, unalterable law. The proud man may pretend in his arrogance to despise everything but himself. In the end, Gods will bring him to grief. Today it has, it has happened, happened here. here. With our, our own eyes, we, we have, have seen an old man through suffering become wise. Globe Theatre presentation on Sunday afternoon on Radio 4 is Luigi Pirandello's six... On map making.